Good evening, everyone here in the European Academy, and of course, um, uh, people who are joining us um, from all over the world um, in the live stream. I would like to thank our partners for their welcome remarks and thank you all for the hard work to finally make this event happen. Actually, Ralph Hosfeld, longtime director of the Lepsis House Potsdam, was supposed to give this keynote and was looking forward to it. We were all shocked by his sudden passing end of July. Rolf and I worked closely together for the Lepsos House for over 10 years. So it's my sad privilege today to deliver the keynote address that he prepared shortly before his death. I hope you understand that there will no Q&A after the keynote, but we will find enough time to discuss the topics of the conference over the next two days. So the title of the keynote is no peace to end all violence, nationalism, imperialism, and internationalism after 1919 by Rolf Hosfeld. In the winter semester 1918, Albert Einstein held a college on his theory of relativity at the Berlin Central University. It had to be canceled in the morning of November 9th because of revolution, as Einstein noted in his diary. The great thing he wrote to his sister in Switzerland two days later had happened. I quote, with us, militarism has been thoroughly eliminated, end of quote. Would this, as Herbert George Wells has prophesied in a 1915 book, and all Wilsonians had promised to the world be the final result of the war that will end war? Would there be a new peaceful era after the dust from the global conflict had settled? We know this was not the case. As Archibald Wavell, the future Viceroy of India, said sarcastically um, of the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, I quote, after the war to end war, they seem to have been in Paris at making the peace to end peace, end of quote. If there had ever been a reality-based plan to overcome the old international system of rival coalitions and power balance through a new liberal world order, which would be based on collective security, national self-determination, free trade and democracy, it did not work. To take up the eponymous title of David Fromkin's classic study, A Peace to End All Peace from 1989, and the detailed narrative of this book Intent and outcome in many cases were not only different, they were often the exact opposite. It is the story of a tragedy, the more that eternal peace had been a deep-rooted European dream. There was the ambitious, ambitious project to make perpetual peace in Europe by Abbé de Saint-Pierre from 1717, and there were others. Most influential had been Immanuel Kant's essay on eternal peace from Ewigen Frieden from 1795. Kant's idea set the framework of what was now discussed under Woodrow Wilson's project of a war to end all wars, and what more or less dominated the mindset of the founders of the League of Nations. But there was no peace. In terms of global power balance, the Great War had been a deluge. The post-war years faced the more or less chaotic birth of a new world order. Empires had collapsed, new nations were born or invented, imperialism faced its peak, and internationalism in different ideological disguises from Wilson to Lenin began to, to, began to become a story of hope. Violence was omnipresent in the wars over Poland and Ukraine, in the Russian Civil War, in Ireland, in India, in the whole Middle East and parts of North Africa, and not least in the troubled Italian post-war years that brought Mussolini to power in 1922. All this was open to a then unknown future in a drama of entangled histories, which had become a global issue due to the destructive time machine of the World War. Let me begin with a scenario dated in the first half of November 1918, in which many of the coming conflicts become visible as in a snapshot. 
On November 9th, when the revolution broke out in Berlin, Josef Pilsudski was sitting in Berlin's Hotel Continental having a late breakfast. Since refusing to take the oath of allegiance to the German Kaiser in July 1917, he had been held as a prisoner of the German Reich in the Magdeburg Fortress. For a long time, he had, he had led three Polish brigades into the field on the side of the central powers against Russia and had been decorated in the process before the legion, which had achieved, achieved frame for its bravery, was suddenly disbanded. On November 8, 1918, the new German cabinet decided to release him. The next day, the Kaiser abdicated. Two days later, from the hands of the Council of Regency in Warsaw, still appointed by the Germans, Pilsudski took over as a commander-in-chief and head of the state of the new established Polish Republic. In those days, Hans von Sekt, the last German chief of general staff in the Ottoman Empire, was on his way home to Berlin when he learned of the Kaiser's abdication. Being stunned and depressed by this news, which meant the end of the world for him. Sekt and Pilsudski were quickly to become enemies as soon as the post war order and the new Polish Western borders were discussed, mainly during the Polish uprisings in Poznan province and Upper Silesia. On November 10th, Mehmet Talat Pasha, the last Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire and the main perpetrator of the Armenian genocide in World War I, arrived in Berlin after escape across the Black Sea organized by the Germans, soon beginning to prepare his comeback by supporting Mustafa Kemal's insurgent movement in Anatolia through the clandestine channels of the Young Turks secret organization, Karakol. And finally, in November 1918, 29-year-old Private Adolf Hitler was recovering in the military hospital of Pasewalk, northeast of Berlin, from the effects of mustard gas poisoning he had contracted near Ypres in mid-October. This news of the monstrous event of November 9, the revolution, the democratic revolution, and the abdication of the Kaiser, he would later say, had caused a deep-seated hatred of the perpetrators of this act to haunt him ever since. Many of these sentiments at the beginning of the year 1919 were all but peaceful. In Germany, after the dreamland of the armistice period and hopes for a Wilsonian just peace, when Berlin was forced to sign the Treaty of Versailles on June 28, 1919, sentiments of revanchism became more and more popular and they were sometimes transnational. Mercenaries of the German Free Corps who had been fighting the Bolsheviks in the Baltics with the assistance of the Entente until the late 1919 began to, began to see themselves as companions in mind with Mustafa Kemal's nationalist movement in Turkey and set up plans of a German East state that should someday reconquer the rest of Germany and abolish the Treaty of Versailles. Some of them were involved in the right-wing Kaputsch of March 1920, which for the first time saw swastikas on the streets of Berlin and which collapsed through a general strike of the trade unions. Wolfgang Kapp had lived in the luxury Berlin home of Hanna von Wangenheim, the wife of the former German ambassador in the Ottoman Empire for the time of the Putsch and before, and before he fled to Sweden. His rooms at Wangenheim's were immediately occupied by Enver Pasha, the former Ottoman war minister who, after some days, left Berlin in a Junkers airplane for Moscow in a secret mission where he, while following his own fantastic plans of revolutionizing the Turkic people of the Middle Asia against Entente imperialism, received a direct from left, directive from Lev Trotsky to the head of the Reichswehr, Hans von Segt. If the Germans could not open a common front against Poland while Mikhail Tushachevsky was approaching Warsaw with his Red Army battalions. A strange situation. 
This could be seen as an early footprint of the Ribbentrop-Molotov Agreement of 1939, but it ended, as we know, in a defeat and in a Polish victory after the so-called miracle at the Wisla. Eastern Europe stayed a zone of war, bloodlands, in the words of Timothy Snyder and the prose of Isaac Babel, for the time being, at least until the years 1922-23. The decline of empires had changed everything. 500 years of Habsburg rule ended when the Czechs, the Slovaks, the Hungarians and the Southern Slavs declared their independence end of October 1918. The German dream of world power that would base on the domination of Middle Europe had come to a dramatic close. 700 years of Ottoman rule were at stake. This empire had its high tides nearly succeeded the dimension of Roman rule over the lands around the Mare Nostrum. The Russian Empire had already collapsed in the October Revolution of 1917. A new world order was creating itself, or was supported by the surviving participants of the older imperialist great game and parts of Europe and the Middle East. Altogether, 10 new nation states in Europe League of Nation mandates and contested ter territories in the Middle East, and this happened more often through the normative power of the factual non-nationalistic sentiments as well as violence and imperialistic power policies rather than through peaceful nego negotiations and conceived treaties. The Ukraine declared its independence after the Russian Revolution 1917. It had been occupied as a puppet state by the Central Powers after the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in 1918 and again started an attempt of national building a year later, always contested by claims of Pesutsky's Poland in the West, left Trotsky's Red Army and Anton Denikin's all-Russian White Army in the East and the South. The Ukrainians, led by Simon Petlura, as their high commander and ideological influenced by Dmitro Donsov, who saw them as Europeans in contrast to the more Oriental Russians, did not succeed with this project, as we know, and ultimately the Western parts of their lands around Lviv and Volhynia were incorporated into Poland, where many saw the Ukrainians anyway only as a regional variation of their own nation while the center and the east became part of the Soviet Union. Yet, the one year of Ukrainian national uprising went along with so far known, unknown waves of mass killings, mostly of Jews in this region. There had been elder patterns of violence that could easily be reanimated in times of failing states, civil war, and national in, nationalistic independence movements. In the Ukraine, Bogdan Shmelnicki's bands had killed 10,000 of Jews during the Zaporozhian Cossacks uprising in 1648 to 1645. A century later, a comparable number was beheaded and this culture of violence had never really ended when Jews fell victims of pogroms that began in December 1918 and ended in December 1919. They were much better organized and happened on a much larger on a much larger scale compared to the notorious pogroms in Kishinev 1903, which had caused waves of immigration mostly to the United States and Palestine. It was the pogrom of Prosukurov in the early 1990s, which made uh, 1990s, which made the Jews against think of Kishinev, instigating a wave of great fear in the shtetls when they heard how Haidamax, Aramil. Cossacks, they had systematically and cold blooded combed the streets of the city house by house, leaving nobody alive whom they could pick up. Approximately 1,100 Jews were killed in this deadly year, most of them from marauding Ukrainian nationalists. 2,100 died from hunger or illness, about half a million lost its whole properties. Contemporary research begins to question how far these events have constituted an important background to the experience of the Holocaust. 
In any case, this wave of mostly nationalistic violence against civilians is a merely untold story, but violence had always been part of the collective memory in the eastern regions. When Sholom Schwarzbart, and we shall hear more about him at this conference, killed the Ukrainian nationalist leader Simon Petlura 1926 in Paris, he called him, uh, I quote, descendant of the bandit murderer Schmelnicki in an article for the New York Yiddish Weekly, The Free Workers' Voice. The past is never dead. As William Folkler once said in the Requiem for a Nun, it's not even past. Aggressive anti-Semitism had a deep roots in this region, but in the context of the Great War and its aftermath, it had been reloaded with anti-Bolshevism, conspiracy theories, and modern ideas of homogeneous nations, not only in the Ukraine. All this has been part of the making of modern Eastern Europe and what Eric Hobson once labeled the age of extremes. It has been characterized by a new religion of modernity, futuristic concepts of constructing new worlds and new orders, an economy based on profit rates, new classification of people, nations, territories, friends and enemies, an apocalyptic style of existential policies, and what Karl Schmidt called decisionism as opposed to negotiation or cultures of social contract. All this had a tendency to violence. Extreme violence in modern times had several roots. Some of them were traditional, other based in the racism of colonial rule. Most, but most significant were those who had been con connected with the spirit of modernity itself. Drawing a pointillistic picture of modern imperial violence, one could, for example, begin with the aerial bombardment of Ayn Zara close to Cipolis by the Italian pilot Giulio Gavotti on 1st November 1911, the beginning of modern air warfare and a policy of police bombing, which is still familiar to us today. One could quote Filippo Tommaso Marinetti's poem Zang Tom Tom, in which an airplane Bulgare set the inhabitants of Erdirn into panic in 1913 by dropping hand grenades in the crowded city, a crime against civilians that this later fascist master poet celebrated as a futuristic victory of modernity. In the words of Walter Benjamin, a larpolar manifestation of the fascist aesthetics of violence. One, co one can go back to the mixed modern traditional population policies of the Bulgarian horrors in 1877, or the killing fields during the Hermidian massacres around Adan uh, um, um, massacres of more than 100,000 Armenians in 1894 to 1896. Not to forget the massacres around Adana in 1909 and the cruelties of the Balkan Wars. One could take a boat following the river Congo and Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness witnessing a pre-Gulag system of forced labor for the purpose of Leopold II of Belgium's profit and rubber trade for an exploding world market after John Boyd Dunlop's invention of pneumatic tires causing approximately 10 million deaths. One could visit the policy of burnt earth and the concentration camps and the Boer Wars in 1899 to 1902 and listen to the triumph of jingoism and the British Islands public opinion, or see ten thousands of Herero and Nama forcibly driven into the Omahaki Desert of today's Namibia to a destiny of nothing but calculated starvation. starvation. This genocidal episode, committed by the German General Lothar von Trotha, happened as imperialistic settlement policy, more, speci more specific, spatial policy, Raumpolitik. But it is hardly conceivable that this brutal genocide in a time which historian Joachim Radkau has labeled the imperialistic age of university would have taken place without a state of panic that in the event of a colony's loss, Germany could have suffered a severe defeat 
in the struggle for existence with rival England. And then there was the shifting into a total war, step by step after August 1914. The phrase, la guerre totale, the total war, appeared at first in the French media in 1917. Total war had many faces. All the horrors of the past areas worked together here, and not only armies, but whole people were drawn into war, as Winston Churchill wrote in his magnus opum, The World Crisis. Europe and large parts of Asia and Africa were transformed into a single desolate battlefield, where, after years of struggle, not armies, but entire people collapsed and were destroyed. It was, as American historian George F. Cannon put it, Europe's seminal catastrophe of the 20th century. The worst single act of exterminatory violence against people in this war had been the Armenian Genocide. What took place in the Ottoman Empire from 1915 on marked the beginning of an entire century of atrocities characterized by genocide and forced ethnic deportations of hitherto unimaginable proportions. The Balkan Wars had already shown widespread campaigns of ethnic cleansing. The East European Habsburg domains, Galicia and Bukovina, were subject to deportations of tens of thousands of ethnically unreliable elements, they call it this way, to Austrian internal camps during the first months of World War I in 1914, months before similar measures could be observed in the Ottoman Empire. In Russia, hundreds of thousands of Jews, German minorities, inhabitants of the Baltic territories, Roma and Muslims from the Caucasus and Central Asia were viewed as potential eternal enemies and unreliable populations on entirely ethnic grounds and subjected to military deportations policy during the war. This was a clearly a radicalization due to a total war that had become a world war after the Ottoman Empire had opened hostilities against Russia on October 15, 1914. A war substantially different from all earlier European wars. For the Ottoman, it was also, and sometimes foremost, a war against the so-called inner enemies and the struggle for new borders of a future Turkish heartland within the empire through a policy of cleansing ter territories. On July 7th, 1915, the German ambassador Hans von Wangenheim cabled Chancellor Theobald von bethmann holwig in Berlin that, based on the precise information he had received from all parts of the country, there could be no doubt that, I quote, the government truly intends to eradicate the Armenian race from the Turkish Empire, end of quote. What did this clear worded statement of a diplomat to eradicate mean? In contrast to the undoubtedly ruthless military deportation policies of the Habsburgs and Russians, the Ottoman domestic war against the whole people as imagined eternal enemies had the distinctly apocalyptic component of a final solution about it for the first time in history. This envisioned a new and fundamentally Turkish Muslim order on the territory of a hitherto multicultural and multi-religious land, violent raumpolitik, spatial policy, executed by the genocide of Christian minorities, especially the Armenians. Since 1913, Constantinople had been ruled by a radical one-party nationalist dictatorship, which was explicitly associated with the absolute domination of the Committee of Union and Progress, COP, over the society and an increasingly unified state apparatus. Thus, the COP, as historian Shukru Hanyolu put it, the avant-garde, of a radical new type of regime that was to become frighteningly familiar in the 20th century. A model of totalitarian rule Central and Eastern Europe would not experience until the 20s and 30s and under different descriptors. 
The COP thus invented a, invented a dark legacy, governing under the auspice of a permanent state of emergency would, following George R. Gumpen, become one of the innovative trademarks of modern political rule. The age of nationalism has always been accompanied by decisionism and the mindset of emergency, also in the Middle East region. Since the beginning of the 20th century, there had been recurrent waves of Turkish, Turkish Muslim nationalism associated with the progressive ethnification of religion. In 1904, the Cairo-based journal Turk published the article Three Types of Policies by Volga Tatar Yusuf Akshura, which was regarded by many as a liberation manifesto and which formulated for the first time the idea of a Turkish nationalism based on ethnicity. According to Akshura, all attempts to unite different ethnicities and religions in one state had failed in the past. One increasingly saw impossible um, Austrian conditions the main reason for the decline of a once strong and heroic warrior nation. This was accompanied by fantasies of awakening a political cultural metaphor of most influential cloud in the age of nationalism still today. Awakening nations tend to be ruthless in their self-empowerment. A semblance wars, for example, the Italian conquest of Libya, fantasized as a continuation of the national risorgimento, a terra promessa, as a first act of rebirth for the once great Italian nation, during which the population of Kyrenia alone fell from 300,000 to 120,000 between 1911 and 1915, caused by the violence of war, massacres, and pogroms. A comparable combination of awakening and self-powerment could be observed among young Turks. I felt how deeply the aspirations of the new Turkey were rooted in the nature of our ancestors were the words of writer Halide Edip. Her ideal warrior type of the modern Turk was the type of an Attila or Genghis Khan who evolved into a civilized man. It was as if the Turks had suddenly rediscovered their hidden being in the vast, vastness of Asia. I quote, the feelings that possess in my blood are the echo of my past, end of quote. Young Turk ideologist Zia Gögalp poeticized. The archaic law of the steppe, parallel to the European cult of primitivism, came into vogue during these years and became an ominous key to the Turkish awakening. As a mental state, this cult of primordial also contributed to an increasing propensity of for violence. The description, uh, the described mixture was toxic especially in the world regions of multicultural and multi-ethnic settlement structures, where the idea of national awakening was always linked to the utopia of absolute purity and security. Already the Westphalian peace of 1648, which ended the times of religious war in Europe, had been based on the concept of territorial homogeneity. The phobic idea that only a homogeneous population would be a trustworthy population had deep roots in history and thus in the cultural unconscious, probably dating back to the persecution of Jews and Muslims and the Spanish Reconquista through its ideological police, police the Holy Inquisition. In the age of nationalism, religion had been replaced by the idea of a cultural or ethnic homogeneous people and the framework of defined borders. What national building meant under these circumstances can be studied in the fate of the Armenians in the Great War. And there was a man who definitely knew this, Adolf Hitler. He admired the young Turks as an example to follow and reference to Enver Pasha in his trial before the Munich People's Court in 1924. According to Hitler, 
Enver managed to build up a whole new nation, successfully detoxifying the multicultural Gomorrah that was Constantinople. This unveiled a deep congruency of fundamental imaginations of ethnic purification. As Stefan Erik, who will give a, presenta a presentation tomorrow, has shown this worldview has been widely shared in early Nazi publications. By this, as the title of the lecture will be Learning from the Turks. Under these conditions, did Woodrow Wilson's vision of a new liberal world order ever have had a chance? The tension between global empowerment in the name of universal principles on the one hand and imperial claims to power, particular contexts, local conditions, and expectations on the, under, on the other hand, inevitably led, according to historial, historian Jörn Leonard, to an overstretched peace. In addition to the Versailles Treaty of June 28, 1919, the other Paris sub-urban treaties changed the political maps. Saint-Germain-en-Laye about German Austria, Nulli sur Seine about Bulgaria, Trianon about Hungary, and Sèvres about the Ottoman Empire. The latter peace agreement when then, was then revised in favor of Turkey in the Treaty of Lausanne on July 24, 1923. 1923 also saw the return, albeit temporarily, of some stability to international relations. With the founding of Mustafa Kemal's Turkey, the Greek-Turkish turmoil largely ended, the situation in the Soviet Union stabilized after the Russian Civil War, and the introduction of the Rentenmark in 1923 ended the hyperinflation in the Weimar Republic. Everything seemed to be getting calmer, moving more into stable of states of mind. In the next two days, the speakers at this conference will broach the issue of these alleged karma times of the interwar period from different angles. Combining the history of humanitarianism and international justice, which I touched not very much in this uh, keynote, on the one hand, and the history of political violence and radical political ideology on the other, we will dive into the abyss of Janus' facedness that has characterized this period. Period. You are welcome to join us and discuss everything in the next two days. Thank you very much for your attention.